mode. Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's Excellence webinar, Spray Dry Dispersion Formulations in Suspensions and Solid Dosage Forms featuring Bend Research Inc. My name is Donna Papacosta and I'll be your host for today. This seminar will run for about 30 minutes including a Q&A session toward the end. This webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to type in questions and comments throughout the presentation by using the questions function located on the panel on the right side of your screen. If we cannot answer your question during the allotted time period, we will send you a direct reply following the live webinar. We will also be running a polling question. We hope that this will drive audience participation. We appreciate your participation and we will share the results with you. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. This event will be recorded and made available for future download. The presentation slides will advance automatically. If you do need technical assistance, please contact GoToWebinar at the numbers displayed. In the U.S., 800-263-6317 or 1-805-617-7000. Now we'd like to begin the formal presentation. For more than 35 years, Bend Research has worked with clients to create value by advancing new medicines that improve human health and to solve their most difficult scientific and technical problems. This success is based on a company's avail ability to develop, advance, and commercialize pharmaceutical technologies. The firm's innovative drug delivery solutions grow from their solid understanding of scientific and engineering fundamentals. Bend Research provides formulation and dosage form support, assists in process development and optimization, manufactures clinical trial quantities of drug candidates in its CGMP facilities, and advances promising drug candidates from conception through commercialization. Bend Research is a leader in novel formulations, including solubilization technologies such as spray-dry dispersions and hot melt extrusion formulations, as well as controlled release, inhalation, and biotherapeutics technologies. I'd now like to welcome our speaker for today's seminar, Corey J. Bloom. Dr. Bloom is the Director of Formulation Science at Bend Research in Bend, Oregon, and has been with the company since 2003. Dr. Bloom's responsibilities include leading a team that develops pharmaceutical formulations to improve stability and bioavailability for oral and local drug delivery, designs in vitro experiments to assess new dosage forms and formulations, and develops biological models to predict drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, ADME. Before being named Director of Formulation Science, Dr. Bloom held the positions of Group Leader and Senior Research Chemist. He holds a Bachelor's Degree in Chemistry from Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota, and he earned his Ph.D. in Analytical Materials Chemistry from Colorado State University. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Corey Bloom. Corey, you may begin when ready. Well, thank you, Donna, for the nice introduction, and uh, thank you to all the attendees for your time and interest. Certainly appreciate that. Um, as Donna said, I'm, I'm Corey Bloom uh, from Bend Research, and uh, uh, again, uh, the title and topic of the, of the talk here is Spray Dry Dispersions, or SED formulations, um, and their use uh, dosing in suspensions and solid dosage forms. So, so we'll, we'll touch on those topics and, and uh, hopefully make make clear some uh, points of particular interest. Um, this, uh, I have a couple slides just before I get into the meat of that that uh, just kind of describe uh, Fund Research, who we are, um, where we are, and, and, and what it is that we do, and then I'll get into the, the meat of the talk. Um, having a little trouble switching slides, though. which was not the case before. Pardon me for the technical difficulties here. Um, Donna or Kim, if you have ideas as to, uh, it appears to be kind of locked up on this first screen. 
There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll be set to go now. Um, so vendor search, um, where are we and who are we again? We'll, we'll just have a couple of slides on this and then I'll get to the, get to the, uh, the main discussion. Um, Bend Research, we are in Bend, Oregon, and uh, I, I imagine there are, are attendees from, from different places around the country who, who may not be familiar with uh, where Bend, Oregon is, so there's a map there that it shows you we're kind of right in the middle of the state in central Oregon, and we're on the eastern side of the Cascade Mountains, uh, which is kind of the dry side, um, so our, our weather is, is quite a bit drier than what you might imagine um, Oregon to be like in, say, Portland or Eugene. Um, and, and we do have, uh, you know, direct access to a lot of mountain recreation, so it's a nice place to live with a nice climate and uh, lots of fun outdoors things to do. Um, our company, uh, currently we have about 205 employees. We've been around since 1975. Uh, and we do have currently four main facilities, uh, which are shown on the slide here. And um, uh, right now I'm, I'm at the research and analytical site in, in Tumalo. Um, we also have, uh, as it says, an engineering and, and uh, pilot plant um, where we do the scale up of, of new formulations. Uh, we do have our, our main GMP manufacturing facility, uh, which is shown there and there right next to each other. And then we have a new uh, facility, uh, which would be additional capacity for GMP manufacturing that uh, we're just in the process of filling out. So we are uh, expanding a bit um, currently, which is, uh, of course, nice. Um, and we like to say um, our company and our facilities are sort of vertically integrated in that we do everything from new technology development um, and analysis all the way through scale up and, and GMP, late stage GMP manufacturing. Um, as far as the technologies that we practice, um, as shown here on this slide, uh, and we kind of have a number of, of what we call mature technologies, which is to say that they've, they've been in the clinic at, uh, at, at pretty late stage in the clinic. Um, they revolve around oral drug delivery. Um, we're, we're probably best known for solubilization, so we're looking at the, the left-hand side of the slide here. We're kind of best known uh, for solubilization, particularly spray dry dispersions. Um, we practice a number of other solubilization technologies routinely, including hot melt extrusion, um, some other nanoparticle-based formulations. We also do a fair amount of uh, controlled release, and we'll touch on that a little bit today. But, but the primary focus of the talk, obviously, again today is, is going to be around spray dry dispersions. Uh, and their, their use in, in solid dosage forms and suspensions. Uh, I won't talk about them extensively at all beyond this. We, we do also practice a number of what we call emerging or new technologies um, that we are continuing to develop, uh, most notably pulmonary delivery, which is a, a pretty logical offshoot of our expertise in spray drying uh, and particle engineering. So um, if somebody's interested in, in those applications, certainly happy to, to talk offline or field questions in another venue. But, but I won't be touching on any of those uh, technologies further today. Uh, so with that, um, to the main uh, part of the talk here, again, uh, we're going to be discussing spray dry dispersions and, and their dosage both in suspensions and solid dosage forms. So this is just kind of an outline of the talk, um, hopefully to, to keep everybody clear on, on the topics that we're going to go over. Um, so he's discussing spray dry dispersions and kind of touching on the three key attributes, um, which are manufacturer performance and stability. And of course, the idea is, is to choose a, a formulation in a process which has acceptable um, attributes in, in, in all three of those areas. Um, and, then, and then we'll move on to discussing uh, dosing, both in the form of, of uh, suspensions, um, a, a dry powder which can be suspended for, for liquid dosing, and then solid dosage forms. Um, both for immediate release uh, and, and modified or controlled release. Um, and, and there's a cartoon here of, of uh, the polymer HPMCS, which I'll, I'll discuss further later. But it is one of the excipients um, that we use often, but not exclusively, for, for SDD formulations. Um, OK, so uh, at a fairly high level, this, this slide kind of shows uh, um, the basics around SDD manufacturing and, and um, uh, drug product intermediate characteristics. So the process, uh, again, at a high level is, is that the drug and, and polymer or sometimes um, additional excipients such as surfactants or, or high surface area supports um, are dissolved or suspended in an organic solvent um, or sometimes a solvent water mis uh, mixture, but of course the key being that it's a fairly volatile mixture. Uh, and, then, and then that's spray dried into a, through a nozzle into a drying chamber, and, and obviously there are 
um, a lot of different scales at which this process can be done, um, depending on the, the scale of sample that's going to be made. Um, and when it's done properly, uh, what you get, as it says, is a homogeneous, um, and stable, amorphous dispersion, um, which uh, has characteristics, uh, you know, that are kind of shown on the right here. So um, by thermal analysis, uh, differential scanning calorimetry, um, you see that you have a single single blast transition temperature, which is evident that evidence of no phase separation, um, uh, you know, a uniform molecular dispersion, uh, you know, no evidence of crystallinity by, by other analyses such as powder X-ray, microscopy, et cetera. Uh, and then morphology is, is, is typically, um, as shown in these scanning electron uh, microscopy images, so, so sort of a collapsed sphere or a raisin-like morphology um, with fairly high surface area. Uh, and, and all of that, uh, again, when practiced properly, the what it gives you is, is a substantial bioavailability enhancement relative to crystalline forms um, in that you get rapid dissolution in the intestinal uh, medium um, by virtue of, of the high surface area and the inclusion of a, of a polymer that's soluble in that medium. Uh, increased solubility relative to crystalline forms um, in that you've got a, an amorphous form rather than a, um, a lower energy crystalline form. And when practiced properly, um, um, which is to say choosing the right excipients and the right drug to polymer ratio, um, you can maintain, importantly maintain that supersaturation or that increased solubility um, in the intestinal tract and, and thus um, support um, substantially better absorption relative to you know, other forms like crystalline drug. Um, and again, we'll, we'll get into later uh, application of STDs into to solid dosage forms, um, uh, powder in a bottle, et cetera. So that's kind of a high level, and we'll go through a little more detail. Um, this is one slide on uh, kind of the physical uh, situation during spray drying, as it says. Um, I'm a chemist. I'm, I'm not a process engineer, and, and I won't go into great detail, a lot of um, engineering-heavy slides, but, but this is um, kind of a useful, one, useful uh, slide, I think, to consider a few key attributes that we get asked about often. I um, mean, you know, why is spray drying? Uh, a good process for um, amorphous dispersions for pharmaceutical applications. Um, one of the key things, as it says on the left there, is, is um, very fast and very mild exposure to, to high temperatures. So um, while there is a fairly high inlet temperature typically for spray drying, the, the product is effectively not exposed to that high temperature um, for any amount of time. Um, there's a very short residence time uh, on the order of milliseconds in which the droplet is actually in that hot region. Furthermore, there's evaporative cooling uh, during that time. So, so really the drug um, and the polymer, for that matter, if you will, don't see uh, a hot temperature like what you have the inlet. And rather, they, they simply are, are exposed to more like the, um, the outlet temperature, which oftentimes is on the order of 40 degrees. Um, so you don't get a lot of prolonged exposure to high temperatures. Um, again, the drying process is very fast on the order of milliseconds. Uh, and so what that allows you to do is, is to trap kinetically trap um, an amorphous dispersion very quickly so that you can operate in, in metastable regimes uh, that might be difficult to, to prepare um, a uniform dispersion by other kind of slower means. Um, and the, 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 the properties of the particles are, are quite tunable by, by process and, and, uh, and equipment selection so that you can, you can tune the particle size um, density, et cetera, um, to be amenable to, to different kinds of processing and presentations. Um, and then another key point is that uh, uh, the process is quite scalable and that, that um, you know, we can go everything from milligram scale up to metric tons. Um, and the, the science of scale there is, is, is quite well understood here now so that, so that it's a pretty seamless process. Uh, moving forward from kind of early formulation development to, to late stage uh, manufacturing. Um, so to that end, uh, what's on this slide just kind of reiterates that last point again. Uh, um, here we have a number of, of spray dryers that are uh, at the smaller scale um, custom built, and then at the larger scale um, commercial units, mostly from Nairo, but with some uh, with some modifications. Um, but but you know across the our development facilities and, and GMP manufacturing facilities, you know you can scan the range from small milligram type quantities to be used for formulation screening, um, formulation testing, uh, stability, you know, predictive stability analysis, et cetera, through scale up, um, you know, on the gram to kilo scale, and then, and then uh, GMP production at the kilo 
to uh, metric ton scale. Um, and we have produced um, many metric tons of, of uh, a late phase three, uh, SED for late phase three compound in the past in our, our GMP facility. So um, our equipment uh, that we have at Ben Research uh, kind of covers the scale, and, and there is certainly other um, CMO equipment um, that is available in the industry that, that, that covers uh, large scale and, and even in some cases larger scale yet um, than what we have here on GMP facility. So it's a very scalable process and, and one that can be used to, to, to take compounds um, through clinical development and, and ultimately to commercial, uh, to commercial launch. Uh, this slide just kind of shows some of the historical experience that we, that we have here. So if we think back to the, uh, back to that outline slide, we kind of had again manufacturer performance stability. So um, kind of on the performance aspect now, this slide kind of shows some of the historical experience uh, that we have here uh, formulating with spray dry dispersions. And, um, you can see large number of compounds um, you know, that we've assessed and formulated. In animal studies, um, over 50 compounds um, in a range of, of um, earlier to later stage uh, clinical studies, including um, late phase three clinical studies. And just a, a few examples in these plots on the lower left here of, of um, the exposure increase that is, is typical to see um, for a well formulated SDD compared to, say, a crystalline drug comparator or, or even a soft gel uh, in one case here. So you see examples of a few. Um, uh, increased exposure in clinical trials there. And then, um, again, just some representative examples in, in animal studies, um, uh, a small number of them that, that again, show, you know, kind of the, the increased absorption is typical. And, again, this comes back to the increased solubility, rapid uh, dissolution in the intestine, and then, and then maintaining that high solubility um, by preventing, say, precipitation crystallization in the intestine. Um, the technology, is, as I kind of mentioned, is, is broadly applicable uh, to a large range of, of chemical compounds or chemical space. There's a map here on the right. Um, it kind of shows that, and I think I'm going to talk uh, more on, on this next slide about it. But the point is, is this is just a, a smattering of a, a number of the compounds, not all of them, that, that um, we have formulated here in SDDs in a, in a kind of simplified representation of chemical space. And you can see they're, they're, they're kind of distributed all over the map. Um, there. So uh, that same map is shown on this page, and I'll go into it in, in more detail. And, and this is kind of a, a place where we bring um, some of the both experience, empirical experience, as well as kind of fundamental scientific understanding of, of dispersion technology to, to bear in, in formulating um, properly and, and quickly with, with the minimum of, of time and cost. So um, one of the ways we do that is, is the use of, of some of these kind of maps, um, which again, uh, what we have is in this plot is kind of a simplified version of uh, drug chemical space. Uh, and so the x the x axis is lipophilicity or log p, and then the y axis is, is um, effectively the driving force for crystallization. And, and what it is is the ratio of the melting point over the glass transition temperature, um, which is the, the thermal transition that uh, amorphous solids go through. Um, and, and the ratio is in Kelvin. That's important to note. So if one were to try to use this map themselves, you'd, you'd want to make sure you were using your your, um, your temperatures in Kelvin and not Celsius. Um, and, and this map and, and uh, an explanation of, of this and, and, and related topics, um, quite a few of which I'm, I'm discussing here, were, were actually covered nicely in, in this paper in 2008 um, that's referenced at the bottom. This was written by a number of um, current and former uh, Bend Research and, and Pfizer employees. So you can you can read some more about it at there and access um, this map there. But uh, again, we use this map and others like it to to sort of select in an early stage as, as a paper exercise, even after a number of um, uh, basic physical chemical property measurements on the drug, which we can do or our clients can do. Um, and we sort of map the compounds out and, and, and you'd be pretty predictive about the types of formulations that are going to succeed. Um, so if we look at the map, um, uh, again, the driving force to crystallize the T over TGs on the y-axis and, and lift the plus your log P on the x-axis. So up in the upper left-hand corner of the plot, you have very, very crystalline compounds, high, um, very high melting point, um, strong driving force to crystallize. And, and they, can, they can 
be limited in, in uh, well, the challenge is, is, as it says, preventing them from crystallizing, of course, out of the amorphous uh, state. And so as such, typically, um, we, one has to operate at fairly low drug loading or low drug to polymer ratio kind of formulations. Um, completely the other regime of the, the plot on the lower right-hand corner of the plot, we see extremely lipophilic compounds, um, but a fairly low drying force to crystallize. Sometimes these are even oils at room temperature. Um, of a different challenge, which is, is due to their extreme lipophilicity, um, uh, you can have difficulty getting uh, rapid dissolution rate even when combined with the polymer. So for that reason, those also typically we have relatively low um, drug loading STDs, or sometimes we even go to, to nanoparticles or some other technologies. Uh, and then kind of more in the middle of the plot, you have a little more um, moderate uh, lipophilicity and, and propensity to crystallize, and so often that you can get a higher drug loading. Um, so this is, is one map that we use, and, and we, we have a number of others that are, are kind of mentioned um, on the left-hand side of the, the slide here. And so we can use these again to select kind of a limited number of formulations that we will screen um, from which to select uh, a lead formulation. So we're not screening 20, 30 formulations. We're screening more like five. Um, and from them, selecting a formulation, again, that, that has acceptable performance, stability, and, and um, you know, the expectation for uh, streamlined manufacturing. Um, I guess one more thing to be said about this map. Um, you see the kind of upper right hand corner of the plot there um, is, uh, is off the charts, if you will, or, or when this map was made, we thought there were no such thing uh, as those compounds. We, we've since um, discovered that uh, uh, medicinal chemists are, are a more and more enterprising lot, and in fact, there are compounds that are, are we've, we've been presented with that are, are off the map here in, in that they have um, as high or higher log feed than what's shown here and, and actually fairly high melting point as well. So um, as one of my colleagues said, people have, chemists have figured out how to make uh, bricks out of grease, which is, is interesting that, that they're able to make them and, and they're certainly a challenge to deliver, but, but um, we have seen a number of those and in fact been fairly successful um, even in that region of space. Um, so things are always evolving. Um, but again, the, the, the main point of this is, is that uh, we use things like this to, to, to be fairly predictive even as a paper exercise about, about what's going to work well. Um, then obviously you go to screening the formulations uh, and testing them to, to see which, which ones look the best. So that map was made specifically um, with the polymer HPMCAS in mind, although certainly the same principles apply um, to the use of other other dispersion polymers, and, and we, as I mentioned, we we often but not exclusively use uh, HPMCAS polymer um, as our, our dispersion polymer of choice. Um, we do use others in some cases, and I'll, I'll maybe describe some of those cases, but this is the one we use the most often. We've, we've found um, most often to, to be the best uh, the best polymer, and uh, if you're not familiar with it, the, the full name is typed out there. It's hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose acetate succinate. So HPMC or hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose is, is a little more common um, excipient. This is, is that polymer with acetate and succinate groups added. Um, they are, it is an enteric polymer. It, it is commercially available from Shinetsu uh, in Japan. And um, it is uh, precedent and accepted for, for use in humans um, and, and very safe uh, even at uh, quite high doses. So. Um, it, it's, again, an inter polymer, and there are three grades or, or class, subclasses that are available. Um, and, and they differ, um, as shown here, uh, in the amount of the acetate and the succinate content. Um, so the three grades are, are designated as L, M, and H. Um, L being having the most uh, succinic acid content, at least acetate. So as such, it dissolves at the lowest pH, and it's kind of the most hydrophilic polymer. Um, the H polymer, on the other hand, has the most acetate. Uh, and the least succinate content, um, as such, it dissolves at the highest pH um, and is kind of the most hydrophobic, and then the upgrade, of course, is in the middle. Um, and, and so there's three grades here that, that depending on the, the properties of the drug and the problem statement, um, uh, the performance and stability can be, be tuned somewhat uh, by the selection of those grades. Um, but all of them share in common, as it says on the, on the right, there are kind of the attributes that, that do tend to make um, this enteric polymer a particularly good choice. Um, as it says, a lot of different functionalities to, to interact with drugs in the solid state and in the and in the um, in the aqueous, you know, in the intestinal medium. So you get a lot of both 
kind of hydrogen bonding as well as hydrophobic interactions. And, and those things tend to lead um, particularly to, to, in many cases, but not all, um, particularly good inhibition of crystallization of the drug out of, out of the supersaturated state. And of course, again, that's one of the key performance attributes. Um, with respect to stability, HPMCS has a particular advantage in that, um, uh, as I'll discuss further, a, maintaining a fairly high glass transition temperature in the solid state is, is a key attribute for, for maintaining good solid state stability. And HPMCS, um, relative to some of the other dispersion polymers, such as PVP, PVPVA, et cetera, has fairly low water uptake, um, as shown on this, this plot in the, the lower right. And so um, as a consequence of that, that relatively low water uptake, it, it maintains a fairly high glass transition temperature. Um, even a high humidity is like a 75% humidity. So what that leads to is, is um, um, oftentimes uh, particularly good solid state stability for HPMCS dispersions relative to, to some other dispersions like maybe a PVP dispersion. So we use this polymer a lot. Um, not always. Sometimes uh, there are chemical stability reasons to formulate away, say to formulate away from the acidic groups, um, in which case one might use HPMC uh, or PVP or PVPVA. Um, Sometimes a, a non-enteric uh, polymer is preferred just for performance reasons, where, where one might want to have, um, say, more dissolution in the stomach or, or very early in the in the duodenum. And so, again, there you might formulate away from the enteric polymer. And then sometimes it's, it's true that there are, in fact, drugs that, that um, say, have more or more prolonged supersaturation with other, other polymers. So we do use other polymers at times, but this is, is um, a polymer we use quite a bit and, and oftentimes we do quite successfully. Um, uh, so, with respect to kind of the, the model uh, for understanding of performance, this is, is um, kind of a cartoon with a few micrographs, but it's, it's pretty um, useful to, to understand how STDs perform. Um, again, this, this was built particularly on our understanding of how HPMCAS dispersions work, although um, the concepts are, are pretty applicable to other dispersions um, as well, which, which oftentimes more or less follow the same kind of model for performance. So, what happens when the STD is, is Hydrated and begins to dissolve in, in uh, the intestine, particularly in the case of HPMCAS. Remember, it's an enteric polymer, so the, uh, the HPMCAS polymer itself is not soluble in the stomach. Um, but, but once the polymer starts gets to appropriate pH to, to uh, hydrate and dissolve, what begins to happen is, is a lot of water up, uh, uptake and swelling um, and dissolution of the polymer. And, and you tend to get, of course, um, dissolution of, of the drug into free drug species. Um, that free drug, of course, for lipophilic drugs tends to also partition into bile salt micelles. Um, and then you also get um, oftentimes quite a bit of these kind of colloidal or nanoparticulate species, which are, are drug polymer um, aggregates. And it's that interplay between a high free drug, which you, of course, want um, for good absorption, um, and these uh, kind of the dissolved polymer and these colloidal species, which oftentimes is very beneficial for, for maintaining that supersaturation and, and pre preventing uh, crystallization, and then as well, um, continuing to, to rapidly resupply the free drug uh, as the free drug and, and the, the bile salt mycelos diffuse across the mucous boundary layer. And the free drug, of course, is, is the species that's, that's being absorbed in the bloodstream. So these, all these other species act to, to provide, if you will, a higher total solubilization and rapidly source free drug as it's absorbed. Um, so that's kind of the, the model, our understanding of the model for performance and kind of the, the speciation, if you will, of, of the different drug containing uh, moieties that are present. And, and when we do uh, in vitro reduced solution testing, we're, we're always trying to understand um, the distribution of these, these different kind of drug containing species and how they affect um, performance in the intestine. Um, so discussing uh, stability a little bit more now, the, the third kind of key attribute of of the formulation, um, we kind of take a, what we call a phase-appropriate uh, approach to, to testing and understanding physical stabilities of STDs. Uh, and you can have, at a high level, you can have a, a you can have stability in a, in a dispersion in two ways. One of which is you can have uh, a thermodynamically miscible system, so that the, the drug is um, at the loading of being used, the drug is is uh, thermodynamically soluble in the polymer, and so there's a in effect, no driving force at all to phase separate or crystallize. Um, in practice, that's that's a fairly rare place to be for a formulation, just in that there are, of course, practical reasons why one wants to 
maximize drug pump on loading. Um, and so oftentimes we're, we're operating in more of a, a, a kinetically stable or metastable regime where you're above the solubility limit of the drug in polymer, but you've kinetically trapped um, the drug in a low, in a low mobility matrix, um, which is to say effectively that, that the glass transition temperature of the system is well above um, the storage temperature. So again, due to the low mobility in that case, you simply don't have the drug uh, able at a relevant time scale to um, to phase separate nucleate uh, crystals and, and then have crystals grow, and so you've, you've just kinetically trapped um, the system. So more often than not, um, the assumption early on in formulation is that is that we're operating in that regime, and so as such, um, at an early stage during formulation development, we'll kind of use a, a rule of thumb approach um, to to have an understanding of, of where the formulation lies um, with respect to glass transition temperature at a given storage condition, and so. Um, we can measure using um, DSC, differential scanning calorimetry, measure the glass transition temperature as a function of humidity. And you can plot that out, and that's, that's what's shown here uh, on the lower left in this plot, and, and compare that to, to some of the, the storage conditions of interest, say, particularly the ICH storage condition. So a key one, um, kind of the most aggressive ICH storage condition is, is 40C, 75% RH. So, uh, you know, you measure the, the glass transition temperature of the STD of the, the low humidities and then at 75% humidity. And, and you can compare at 75% humidity the measured glass transition temperature to um, the storage condition. So in this case, what, what's being shown here in this plot, um, the STD has a, uh, uh, in this example STD, the STD has a TG of, of 46 degrees at 75% humidity. So there's only a difference of about 6 degrees there. And you'd like to see more like 10 or ideally 20 degrees of, of separation there. So that you know, again, that you're in a low mobility state. You're not near the glass transition temperature where, where you, you have higher mobility and you can have nucleation. And so in this case, at this high temperature and humidity condition where the storage temperature was very close to the TG, in fact, after three months, crystals are observed. Whereas um, at a lower temperature and humidity, um, where we're further from the, uh, further from the TG, um, at, at long times, you do not see any, any crystallization again due to low mobility. So this is kind of a this is kind of a, a rule of thumb approach where what you'd like to see is at least 10 to 20, 10 or better yet 20 degrees of separation between the TG and the, the storage temperature um, at, at, at humidity of interest. Um, then uh, as you get further in development, um, of course, you get to um, setting up real time stability samples, and, and the idea, you know. In our minds, is always to, to set up the real-time stability samples, but but to be checking those against your prediction and your expectation rather than, than you know sort of hoping for the best. Um, so so of course you run real-time stability, um, and we also um, you can also do some some more kind of kinetic predictions, particularly when you're in that gray region, say of, of 10 degrees or or so um, separation between the TG and the storage temperature, or, or even closer to it, and you want to understand the kinetics of that crystallization better. Um, we can use other uh, we can use um, uh, other thermal methods to to get a better idea of the kinetics uh, there. So again, this is kind of the the screening process or, or physical stability um, phases that we would go through. That so that you're at an early stage having an idea of what to expect, and then at a later stage having more confidence and, and more data to support that. Um, so uh, this is what I refer to as as um, kind of uh, Gaining a, a more quantitative understanding of the kinetics of crystallization, particularly when you do have a dispersion that's, that's kind of close to a, a potential edge of failure in a storage condition of interest. So this is the use of thermal activity monitoring um, TAM, uh, or also called uh, isothermal calorimetry. And, and what's done in this method is you take the, the sample and, and you store it at a condition um, typically above the glass transition temperature, so where you are in that higher mobility rubbery state, um, and you actually so you hold the, the sample, um, knowing the TG versus RH curve, which is, as I showed on the previous slide, you, you use that information to select conditions so that you, you expect to have um, crystallization at a reasonable time scale of a couple days to weeks. Um, and then you actually measure heat flow at that condition, and, and that's what's shown at the top here. Um, you could pick a, a sort of percent crystallinity of interest, and, and we've sort of um, used the 5% Heat flow corresponding to about five percent of crystallization as, as indication of, of uh, you know sufficient crystallinity to to 
have confidence measuring it and for it to be um, an important change. And so you can take that time as a function of storage condition, or, or in this plot down here, a, a TG over T um, presentation. So the time to crystallization versus the, um, the mobility, if you will, um, which is reflected in a TG over T. And you can put the, the data points on here, which are what the red points are, and extrapolate that out to less aggressive conditions in longer times, and actually have now some kinetic information which you can extrapolate and have a much better idea of um, um, the kinetics of crystallization, which uh, uh, of course are going to be, be dependent on, um, again, the driving force for the drug to crystallize, um, as well as the, the interactions between the polymer, et cetera. So you can use that, we use that kind of early rule of thumb um, effort to, to have an, a, good, a good idea of where we think we stand. Um, you can call out where you might be um, close to a potential edge of failure, and then you can use some of these more advanced kinetic methods to, to be more quantitative about what's expected. And you can predict regimes, say, where you might have six months or two years of, of storage um, stability. And, and, and What's shown in, in the right here in these SEMs are, are then real-time stability data um, in the form of, of images in this case. We're at, at say, a 40-degree, 25% humidity. We're well away from, well, away from the TG. Um, we have, um, there's physical stability, whereas at 40, 75, um, over here, um, where we're actually storing above the TG in this particular um, SCD's case, you can see crystallization. So it's going to be dependent on formulation. Um, oftentimes, you, you we, you can, in fact, have an STD that, that is, has a high enough TG at 75% humidity that it, it can be stored at 40, 75. Sometimes you don't, and so you need to either try to formulate around that or, or be aware of it and, and package appropriately. Um, so that's, uh, um, that kind of covers the, the first part, which is freight eye dispersions, and I, I see here um, eating up a fair amount of time. Um, so for the second part, the, uh, the dosage forms and suspensions, I'm going to probably go through this a little more quickly. I'm obviously happy to, to field a few more questions if, if I gloss over something at the end. Kind of a key point that, that I want to make here, particularly about dosing is well, both suspensions and immediate um, release forms is, is SCDs are, are quite amenable to, to both suspensions and um, tablets and even capsules, although uh, it, it can be done wrong, and it can be done wrong in such a, a way that you get, if you will, a false negative, where you're getting poor um, disintegration, dissolution, and of course poor um, absorption, um, which isn't necessarily that, that you have a bad formulation or that the SCDs won't work, but simply they weren't kind of pre presented in, in the correct way. And so that's something, uh, of course, to be to be warned against, and, and that, that um, we'd like to avoid um, kind of false negatives. And then. Probably just briefly touch on a little bit um, the inclusion of dispersions in, in modified dosage forms or um, controlled release. So for immediate release, uh, again, STDs are quite amenable to suspensions, either for animal, um, you know, efficacy, um, safety, tox kind of studies, uh, as well as um, clinical trials as a powder in a bottle. Um, we do very often um, in our hands uh, use an immediate release tablet approach. A uh, rapidly disintegrating tablet is, is our usual approach for um, STDs in the solid dosage form. And then uh, they can be placed in capsules, um, certainly, although, although I'll sound um, a, a few notes there, just, just again, that, that um, if, if one isn't careful, you can get some poor, poor performance from a capsule, particularly that's, that's an artifact of how they're prepared rather than an indication that the STD won't work. Um, and, then, and then dispersions can be put into a number of different controlled release dosage forms. And, and we do this here, uh, including an osmotic tablet um, or a swallowable core tablet, as we call them, or um, spray layer dispersion, which is kind of a, a bead-based approach, um, which has, is a pretty flexible platform. Um, and then, uh, in principle, they could be put in a matrix tablet, although that's that's not a, a method that we practice often here. Um, so for dosing of suspensions, again, um, SCDs are well suited for this growth. Route. And uh, it's very nice for animal studies, so um, see they have to see PK talk studies. Um, and and uh, um, in some cases, STDs, um, we, our clients have used them for, for talk studies where they might even have a crystalline form that's uh, sufficient for absorption at fairly low doses, but, but they need uh, an increased, um, increased solubility um, platform for talk studies alone. So it's a nice, uh, robust platform for doing this. Um, Typically, uh, we use an 
aqueous methicil A vehicle, although um, other vehicles, other aqueous vehicles can certainly be used. And when done properly, um, it's it's pretty difficult to get um, a suspension stability on the order of a day to a week. Um, of course, again, this is a high energy dosage form, which is, is part of the performance advantage. So, as such, as an aqueous suspension, you typically do not have infinite um, stability, and so that's something that, that you need to um, to test and, and, and formulate around making sure that you do have a stable suspension. But it's quite difficult to have them um, at, you know, useful for a day to a week, um, which is nice, of course, for top studies. And, and um, depending on the, the loading of the drug in, in polymer, um, you can see some of the, the um, typical del maximum deliverable doses um, down here. And if you have a, a, a pretty high uh, drug loading in your SCE, you can get up into the, the many hundreds of, of makes per case kind of um, doses, you know, for using tox. So as far as preparing the suspension, again, this is something I want to touch on. Um, there's a number of, of potential ways to do this. Um, we use a mortar and a pestle method that I'll describe uh, in more detail on the next slide to, to make a nice uniform suspension that, that um, is, is easily be easily syringable to give you a uniform dose. Um, there's a couple other potential ways to do it, and, and some of them do not work so well. And, and I should say, particularly again, our experience here is, is most often with HBMC SSDDs, but, but with others as well, um, it's really best, you know, in our hands to to make a suspension the, the way that's shown here. Um, so it says that the right way and the other ways. Um, so uh, uh, the way that we recommend making these suspensions is you have your your SDD powder in a, in a mortar and pestle, and you bring the vehicle in slowly, kind of dropwise um, with. It doesn't take a lot of force or anything, but just, just with some nice movement um, there in the mortar and pestle. And you form kind of a uniformly wetted paste. And this is really key um, to, to just uniformly wet the SDD. Then you can bring in the rest of the vehicle and, um, and, and mix it further, and then you have a syringable or florable suspension. Um, if you don't do that, if you just kind of dump it in and, and say try to vortex or use a stir bar, um, oftentimes what you can get is, is kind of a, a, a cow eye or a, a situation where you get non-uniform wetting, you get some kind of gelling and some kind of dry, dry, grainy or chalky suspensions. And it can take a really long time to break up those, break those up and get a uniform um, suspension. So, so we really recommend against those methods. Um, we do, sometimes other people will use uh, homogenizers. Um, and uh, I know that, that people sometimes have good luck with that. So um, that's a method that can sometimes work. But, but we recommend routinely um, Particularly at an early stage, using this kind of mortar and pestle approach, we've had a lot of good luck with it. Um, and, and I should mention, this discussion is particularly around fairly high loading or, or high dosage regime um, kind of presentations. If, if you're going for a, a powder in a bottle kind of approach, um, you know, with, for an efficacious human dose, typically the concentrations are much lower, and simple shaking um, of the bottle with the vehicle and, and the powder will suffice. But when you're going for a high loading, you, you really want to, to guard against these kind of poor wetting. And again, this is some of the things that can lead to, to false negatives if, if they're done improperly. Um, uh, immediate release tablets is, is kind of our typical way that we approach uh, solid dosage forms. Um, so let's describe it a little bit here. Uh, most often, we will use a dry granulation approach, um, so a, a roller compaction in a milling. Um, followed by compression or, or kind of simulating that at a small scale um, to, to formulate a, a rapid disintegrating tablet. And it's kind of the same idea here with, with the solid dosage form as, as with the suspension. What you want to do is quickly uniformly wet and disperse those SDDs um, so that you don't get that kind of gelling and, and uncontrolled slow disintegration and dissolution. And so we've had a lot of good uh, success using this methodology. Um, and as it says here, it is quite typical to get 50% or even up to 70% of the tablet mass to be an SDD. Um, HPMCS SDDs here, again, are, are actually particularly um, beneficial in that um, it's a little bit easier to get good uh, disintegration in the gastric medium. Uh, because the polymer is not soluble in the gastric, it's not wanting to kind of rapidly gel and set up before you get that nice disintegration. So it's not to say you can't put other SDDs in, in an IR tablet with other polymers, but sometimes um, it can be a bit more of a challenge to get uh, the rapid disintegration that you're after. And there's some example data here in the lower right that shows um, comparing in, in a clinical trial um, SDD suspension or a powder or model versus a, a, an IR tablet, and you can see there's um, 
no difference between the data. And so it's quite difficult to be able to recover that performance of the suspension in a tablet. Um, SDDs can be put in capsules um, and get good performance, although, again, I would, would sound a, a, just a bit of a note of caution here. If one is to, um, particularly in the case of HBMCS or the other, um, uh, some of the other kind of cellulosic type performers, if you just stuff the SDD into a capsule and, and maybe kind of tamp it in there, what you tend to get oftentimes is, is again, kind of some gelling, some slow dissolution and disintegration and, and performance quite a bit worse than what you would expect from a uh, you know, the suspension itself, and that's what's shown um, here on the lower left. Um, now, you can formulate around that um, with, again, the use of, of maybe some disintegrant or even some granulation and then placing them into a capsule, and, and we've certainly had uh, luck doing that here. Um, so it's not to say that SDDs can't be placed in capsules, um, and it's not to say that some other SDDs, um, particularly with, with relatively hydrophilic drugs, Sometimes just putting the SCD right in the capsule does, does work adequately, but at the very least, obviously, you want to test that in vitro and make sure that you're not um, altering the performance of the SCD. And, and it, it's quite difficult um, in our hands to see that just placing them in a capsule alone without any additional excipients um, can lead you to some, some poor performance than you might expect. Um, I, I think we I probably want to get to the, the question and answer session uh, quickly here. Um, but. Uh, Maybe just briefly, I'll, I'll touch on putting dispersions in some controlled release or modified release formulations. Um, so we do practice here a, a swallowable core technology, which is, is similar to the ALSA um, osmotic or push-pull systems that, that have been, you can see in the literature or, or in commercial manufacturer elsewhere. Um, and the way that technology works is that it's a bilayer tablet, where you have a drug layer, which, which in the drug layer can be either crystalline drug or dispersion, um, along with some other excipients. Uh, and then there's a sweller layer, um, so again, it's a bilayer tablet, and then, and then the tablet is coated with a semi-permeable coating, which, um, which you can tr control the water permeability, and there's a laser drill hole on the drug side. And so as water comes in, again, which is controlled by that coating, um, what happens is the sweller layer swells, and it, it sort of extrudes or pumps the drug layer out through that laser hole. And what you get is a very nice linear um, release rate, such as what's shown on, on the plots here. I um, mean, you can, as it says, tune that release rate um, by the composition and thickness of, of that coating. So it's a very nice, very controllable uh, technology for getting kind of zero order release rate. I mean, and it can be, in this case, um, release in a solubilized form. Um, so that's all great. The, the one, you know, potential disadvantage or, or the thing of note that, that, of course, with the bilayer um, and some of the other excipients, you are minimizing the, the total drug load that you can have in there. So it's, it's not ideal if you, if you have a high dose situation. Um, but for a relatively low dose, where you want a really controlled um, release profile, this is a great technology. Um, we also, uh, oh, here's some, uh, some data, some uh, in vitro and in vivo data using um, a swallowable core tablet with SDD um, comparing to a suspension. So there's in vitro data on the left here, disso data. Um, I would point out it's maybe a little bit, not quite apples to apples here in the, in the, the green or the, the tablet is a sink condition, whereas the suspension was placed in a non-sink. But of course the point is you get very rapid dissolution for a suspension and much more controlled slower dissolution for the tablet. Um, and then you can see the corresponding uh, in vivo data, and this is dog data by the way, um, with a 25% active um, HPMCS dispersion. And you can see the difference between the, the fairly rapid um, absorption that, and then and then elimination that you get for the SCD versus quite a bit longer um, absorption profile for the SCT. Um, so it's a nice technology when, when you need that niche of, of both solubilization and controlled release, particularly if the dose is fairly low. Um, we also practice spray layer dispersions quite a bit, which is a fluid bed um, approach. So you're, you're now in a fluid bed um, spray layering uh, a dispersion onto a, a bead. So typically you'd use either um, sugar um, nuperyl cores or, or uh, uh, cellulose core, and you can put a layer of dispersion uh, on it. And then in addition, on top of that, uh, one can put uh, controlled release layers, like say CAPEG or FSL HPMC. Um, of course, you can put an enteric layer, et cetera. So a lot of flexibility in this platform in, in terms of um, you know, how you can construct the, the layers of the beads, and we practice this fairly often. And, and then these are, of course, very amenable to, to placing them right into a capsule um, 
And so this is an approach that we use quite often again to get the, if we want that combination of solubilization and control for these. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. And um, again, thank you for your interest and your time. Um, happy to answer uh, a number of questions now. I would, I guess, point out that, that um, myself and a colleague, um, Dana Sattel, are going to have an additional webinar um, in the not too distant future on September 29th, which uh, um, if you're interested to hear more, certainly uh, contact um, Phoenix Ivers at, at the contact information below. Or again, if you'd like to contact um, um, me offline with, with questions or, or what have you, um, you can see my contact information there, and I, I'd um, certainly be receptive to that. So again, thanks for your time, and I'm um, happy to entertain uh, some questions if there are some. Thank you very much, Corey. Yes, we're moving into the Q&A part, and I'd like to invite our audience to continue sending questions or comments by using the questions panel on the right side of the screen. In the meantime, we will start with a short polling question that we uh, hope you will enjoy taking part in. What drug delivery technologies would you be interested in hearing about? And your choices are spray-dry dispersions, hot melt extrusion, Modified release oral multiparticulates, modified release osmotic tablets, or inhalation. So, if you please take a moment to answer that question. Thank you. We'll just take a moment for the uh, poll to get tabulated there. And you can select more than one. We have 20 more seconds. OK, thank you very much. So 83% said spray dry dispersions, 67% hot melt extrusion, and 50% tied for the both forms of modified release, both oral multiparticulates and osmotic tablets, and just 17% for inhalation. So uh, do you have any comment on that, Corey? Um. I guess maybe just one quickly. Yeah, it sounds like there is indeed, you know, in addition to interest in spray dry dispersion, some um, quite a bit in hot melt extrusion, and, and we do have uh, significant equipment and experience with hot melt extrusion. And um, it's a great technology, and, and what we see is that it's it's applicable to kind of a subset of the the formulations, that is, the drugs and polymers that that one can spray dry. A subset of those where you have a a, a drug that's fairly low melting and thermally stable, and and um, polymers, particularly um, things like PVP, PVPVA, and um, uh, Solute Plus, which is a new BASF polymer. We have formulations that are, are well suited to HME. I mean, it really does have some nice manufacturing advantages that, that make it low cost. So um, I think the way we see it is, is one can screen, if you want, at small scale, screen uh, dispersion formulations using SDDs and then, and then later, if it makes sense, transition to, to HMEs. I mean, that's, um, we certainly manufacture, um, you know, uh, clinical trial materials by HME fairly routinely here as well, and it, it is a good, nice complementary technology to SDDs. Thanks, Corey. And uh, we have some questions here. We received a couple of similar questions, uh, so we'll, we'll wrap them together. Is HPMCAS the universal polymer for general use? Um, well. That's maybe a bit of a strong statement. We certainly use it um, the most often of, of the dispersion polymer. So I, I'll assume the question kind of pertains to, to use in a in a in a dispersion particularly. Um, we we use it the most often among the polymers, um, but it is not it is not always the right answer. So again, the advantages of it are that it, it is particularly good at, at providing um, solid state stability and that it maintains a, a high TG um, at elevated humidity. Um, with respect to performance in the intestine, particularly it provides both um, particularly good supersaturation and then, and then maintenance of that supersaturation or, or preventing crystallization. But it's not always the best with respect to performance. There are, um, again, cases where, um, for instance, one might want to use a non-enteric polymer to get um, more complete dissolution in the stomach, um, say to get really rapid onset, um, you know, high in the small intestine. Um, Sometimes there are, are chemical stability reasons why uh, HPMCS is an acidic polymer, and so um, sometimes there are, are chemical stability reasons why one wouldn't want a dispersion with a, an acidic polymer, and, and so for that reason, you would choose a neutral polymer. So 
I wouldn't quite say it's it's universal, but but we do certainly use it um, the most often, and, and I would say at the least in one of screening formulations for dispersions, it would be a good one to screen. Well, related to that is a question, what other polymers have you used or recommend for SDD? Sure. Um, yeah, again, we, we also use uh, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose, so HPMC, which is, of course, kind of the precursor to HPMCAS. So that's a, a cellulosic non neutral non enteric polymer that we use fairly often. Uh, PVPVA, um, co copovidone, uh, is a good one um, to be used. And, and that one is particularly, one nice thing about that one is it is particularly well suited to um, hot melt extrusion. Uh, PVP is a typical one. Uh, so PVP and, and the VA are both um, uh, a little more hydrophilic, particularly PVP is quite hydrophilic. Um, and so sometimes those can be useful if you want a non-enteric, a little more hydrophilic polymer, um, particularly for the very lipophilic drugs. Uh, BASF has a, a polymer they sell for dispersions, and, and they intentionally engineered it to be good for hot melt extrusions called Solu Plus. Um, so that's one that, that, that we use occasionally. Um, Oidrigates, the Oidrigates uh, series, you know, acrylate-based polymers um, also can be useful, and there are there are enteric and non-enteric, and actually reverse enteric versions of Oidrigates that, that we will occasionally use. Um, so all of those are kind of in the arsenal, um, and then of course one can combine um, surfactants such as um, chloronic, tween, uh, SOS, etc. You you can go to a three component system where you combine uh, surfactants. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That is, oh, we have one more question that we're going to cover today, and that is, what is the regulatory status of HPMCAS as regards to pharmaceutical applications? Yeah, it's, it's approved for use in the U.S., and uh, um, we worked, uh, Pfizer, it, it was, it's made by uh, Shinetsu in Japan, and um, we worked for quite some time with Pfizer on, on dispersions with HPMCAS. Um, and uh, Pfizer actually prepared a safety package and, and the, got the polymer approved uh, for use in the U.S. And um, we do have access to a, a type 5 uh, DMF file that, that describes the, the doses at which it's been used in animals and humans. And so there's a very extensive safety package um, for it. And as well, it is approved for use in humans in, in the U.S., uh, Japan, and Europe. Thanks. Uh, if, by the way, participants, if your question was not answered, you will, be, you will be receiving a direct reply after the webinar. So thank you so much. It's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And if you missed part of the presentation, don't worry. You can visit www.excellience.com where you can download any of our archived scientific seminars. If you want to share this presentation with your colleagues, Simply note their name and email address in the post-webinar survey, and we will send them a link to the archived presentation. Please join me in thanking our speaker for today, Dr. Corey Bloom, who is Director of Formulation Science at Bend Research. And if you enjoyed today's presentation, we encourage you to register for a complimentary webinar from Bend Research on September 29th, as you can see on your screen, from 11 a.m. to noon Eastern Time, spray dry dispersions, robust formulations, and science of scale from preclinical to launch. To register, you can email phoenix.ivers at bendresearch.com for more information. You will notice that a post-event survey will pop up on your screen at the end of today's seminar. Please fill out this survey because we would really appreciate your feedback as well as your suggestions for future webinar topics. Thank you all for your time. We hope you found this webinar informative. Have a great day.